It's one thing to know what you stand for. It's another thing to defend someone who believes in the complete opposite. How much would you risk to defend someone you strongly disagree with? Patriot, American founding father, and future president, John Adams, risked his business and his reputation to defend the British soldiers accused of a massacre. I'm Bob Summers, and this is a presidential story. In 1770 Boston, Massachusetts, tensions were running high. British troops had been stationed in Massachusetts for 17 months to enforce the heavy tax burden imposed by the Townsend Acts. On the evening of March 5th, 1770, a 13-year-old wig maker's apprentice, Edward Garrick, disrespected a British officer in front of the Boston Custom House on King Street, today called State Street. A British private on guard duty Hugh White escalated the exchange, and soon a crowd had started to gather. As the church bells rang, more and more people arrived, until the crowd was around three or four hundred colonialists. Eight British reinforcements arrived, including Captain Thomas Preston, the officer of the watch at the nearby barracks. The colonialists were throwing everything they could find, from ice, broken glass, and oyster shells, to provoke the British soldiers. One of the soldiers was knocked down and was so angry, he fired his musket, without orders, into the crowd. This prompted other soldiers to fire. In total, 11 colonists were hit. Three died instantly. Two more died within days from their injuries. Captain Preston and the eight soldiers were arrested the next day. Within three weeks, they, along with four civilians accused of firing on the crowd from the window of the custom house, were indicted by a grand jury. They had approached several lawyers to represent them in their defense, but no one would take their case. No one, that is, until 35-year-old lawyer and American patriot John Adams agreed to lead their defense team. But why? The risks were many. These soldiers were so unpopular that by defending them, he risked his reputation and the future income from his law practice. Plus, The mob could be so violent, it could put his life and that of his wife and young children at risk. There was another reason he didn't have to take this case. He and his wife were still grieving the loss of their daughter, Susanna, and they had another child on the way. There's a lot we don't know about Adam's motives, but here are a few of the theories. Adams believed that everyone was entitled to a fair trial and competent representation. So, in the long term, he may have believed he would be remembered as a man who put law above his personal beliefs. One other theory is that he took the case in exchange for a seat in Boston's legislature. I would like to believe that the first theory is the true theory. The defense team, headed up by Adams, was mainly assisted by Josiah Quincy, who was the younger brother of the prosecutor for the case, Samuel Quincy. It is ironic that revolutionary John Adams took the job of defending the King's soldiers, while loyal prosecutor Samuel Quincy was responsible for proving them guilty. Seven months passed to allow feelings to cool down before the trial started. But during those seven months, the Sons of Liberty, founded by John Adams' cousin Samuel Adams, waged a propaganda campaign to affect public opinion against the British crown. As part of that campaign, Paul Revere made an inflammatory engraving of that night, that night which was now called the Boston Massacre, and printed it in the Boston Gazette. Amongst this heightened rhetoric, Captain Preston, who was tried separately from his soldiers, began his trial on October 24th in Boston's new courthouse. The plan for the defense was to prove that Captain Preston did not order the shooting. The prosecution called 15 witnesses to prove that Preston had ordered his men to shoot. Much of the cross-examination by the defense was centered on who shouted the word fire. Their testimony was not aligned. The defense produced 23 witnesses who testified that soldiers were intimidated and provoked by the crowd. 
The trial only lasted six days, which for a murder trial was quite long back then. There were some important firsts in this trial. This was the first time a jury was sequestered. It was also the first time the phrase reasonable doubt was used as a standard for guilt. So, after much deliberation, Captain Preston was acquitted. Eventually, Preston retired from the army and settled in Ireland. After Preston's acquittal, the defense for the other eight soldiers became more complicated. If Captain Preston didn't give the order to fire, that means one or more of the soldiers fired without orders. So, Adams' defense strategy focused on the actions of the mob that threatened the soldiers. And with this self-defense strategy, the most they were guilty of was manslaughter, not murder. The turning point in this second trial was the testimony of Patrick Carr, one of the wounded victims. Carr was on his deathbed, so his testimony was presented in court by his physician, John Jeffries. Jeffries was an interesting guy. As a side note, he accompanied French inventor Jean-Pierre Blanchard on his 1875 balloon flight across the English Channel. And Jeffries was one of America's first weather observers. National Weather Persons Day is celebrated on his birthday, February 5th. Back to the trial, Jeffries, testifying on behalf of Patrick Carr, admitted that the soldiers were provoked and fired in self-defense. And Carr did not blame the soldier who shot him. Under cross-examination, other prosecution witnesses also admitted that the crowd were throwing objects and provoking the soldiers to fire. Six of the eight soldiers were found not guilty. The other two were found guilty of manslaughter and avoided the death penalty. They were granted leniency, avoiding jail time. But their thumbs were branded with the letter M for murder, so that if there was a next time, there would be no leniency. The four civilians were also acquitted. Part of the brilliance of Adam's defense was that he did not alienate jurors sympathetic to the Sons of Liberty by blaming the mob. Instead, he blamed London for sending the troops in the first place. After the trials, Adams' law practice was booming, and three months after the trial, he was elected to the Massachusetts House of Representatives. With his political obligations and his heavy caseload, Adams fell ill from exhaustion. Eventually, he and his family moved from Boston back to his home in Braintree. In 1774, Adams became a member of the Continental Congress, which led him away from his law practice and toward the politics and governance of the new nation, culminating in his role as the second president of the United States. Reflecting back, this is how John Adams looked upon his service in the defense of the British soldiers. The part I took in defense of Captain Preston and the soldiers procured me anxiety and obloquy enough. It was, however, one of the most gallant, generous, manly, and disinterested actions of my whole life, and one of the best pieces of service I ever rendered my country. Judgment of death against those soldiers would have been as foul a stain upon this country as the executions of the Quakers or witches, anciently. As the evidence was, the verdict of the jury was exactly right. Could you take the actions that Adams did? He saw this as one of his greatest acts for his country, because it established the United States as a nation of laws designed to protect everyone. I certainly hope we don't lose that ideal. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please click the like button and subscribe to hear more presidential stories. And please visit POTUS.com to learn more interesting facts about the presidents.